Uh, welcome everybody to our continuing uh, study in the Gospel of John. Now, two things uh, before we have the opening prayer, uh, especially for our YouTube audience. Uh, today is April the 8th. This is Monday, first Monday after the fifth Sunday of Lent. This begins what is called Passion Week. And then Palm Sunday starts, of course, Holy Week. Now, we will not be able next week during Holy Week to have our class. And because the parish will be closed, Elvis says everything on the Monday after Easter, we will not pick up again until April, Monday, April the 29th. So I keep that in mind. And um, this particular class is going to be a bit different in that it's going to be sort of about 30 minutes. This is going to be kind of a shorter class. And so, because we're going to go through something interesting tonight, today. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. We praise you, O Lord, and we adore you, because through your holy cross you have redeemed the world. As we begin this Passion Week, help us, Lord, to understand your cross and the glory of your resurrection. Amen. Now, we've gone through, so far, this concept of the Advocate. Jesus, remember, said, I will send you another Advocate. <clears throat> so Jesus identifies himself as being an Advocate. The word in Greek I mentioned is paraclete. Are we uh, parakletos? We say it paraclete. So the idea is that Jesus is presenting the Holy Spirit also as a person. And so we went through that before. And an identification with himself. And also, I talked about the difficult language we have here. Uh, remain in me. I remain in you. Remain in me. Be in my love. Why all this? Well, here's what's happening. Jesus, this is something new for which vocabulary does not exist. A reality, a spiritual reality that has never been heard of before. And a reality, therefore, unexperienced before, unheard of before, and therefore there is no vocabulary for it. Remain in me as I remain in the Father, the Father remains in me. You know how you keep going through that? Well, here is what's happening. Jesus is trying to explain the experience of communion. This is a different reality. People follow Moses. People follow or are disciple of a prophet. There are people who believe in God and seek to worship pray, etc. But people do not follow Jesus Christ the way we follow a prophet. And even in the non-Christian world, the way you would follow uh, Prince Siddhartha, which we call the Buddha, okay? This is a totally different reality. Or if you're Muslim, you follow the prophet, you know, Muhammad. This, this is totally different. We do not follow Jesus Christ. We actually participate in his life. We become a part of his life. We are participating in it. 
So when Jesus will use these words, for example, um, the Father is glorified in your bearing much fruit. Uh, what's going on is that we're able to participate in the ministry of Jesus. We are participating in his own mission. That is a big difference. We just don't talk about Jesus and say, here's what to believe. We actually claim to be able to participate in his ministry and in his mission. That's a big difference. That's unheard of. There's no word for this. And I mentioned communion. Have you noticed how strange it is, is that we've got five chapters at the Last Supper, but unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have you seen an incident here about the Supper? Other than he washed their feet? All right, what's going on? Why is it this is conspicuously absent? Much of what is going on here is an explanation <clears throat> of the meaning of communion. We're participating in his life. Now, why is it absent? The best explanation is that you're at the end of the first century, correct? So there has already gone on at least a minimum of 50 years of Christian practice and Christian celebration of the Lord's Supper. And by the end of the first century, the following began to take place. You can even see this in some of the writings of the early 2nd century, like in St. Justin the Martyr. Christians wanted to keep the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, um, maybe use the word secret, but unadvertised, let's say, because non-Christians, the pagans, were taking the words of the Last Supper and distorting them to accuse the Christians of some rather bizarre practices. Not only that, but even in this, by the end of this early century, people who were catechumens people who were not baptized, you may be studying to prepare to come into the Christian faith and baptism, but catechumens were dismissed from the assembly after the readings and the homily, the liturgy of the word. Catechumens could not, not if you were not baptized, you could not witness the celebration of the Eucharist. In fact, when the RCIA, you know, started in many places uh, during uh, Lent, I don't know, uh, not every parish does this, but in many parishes, the catechumens, not those that were baptized Christians who were coming, but if you were the unbaptized, would be led out of the church to go over to a class to study about things, right? Okay, okay. Yeah, you've done that. Okay, fine. So you know what I'm talking about. And so by the end of the first century, this is a, a standard, this is what's going on. And so anybody can pick up a gospel and read it, correct? It's a public document now. And so that would be the reason because this is at the end of the first century. You have that particular dimension going on. And it's not like John didn't know about it or something. 
this is done, you know, for, for a reason. That's why it's there. And so this whole vocabulary, remain in me, I in you, you in me, the Father in me, I'm in the Father, you know, it just goes on. Jesus trying to explain. And so that's the big difference in terms of Christianity. We participate in the life of Christ. And in the resurrection, Christ is not a past event. He's present. And so we are participating in his mission. This becomes obvious in the Gospel of John. Uh, in the scene of the resurrection. But you'll notice that even in the other Gospels, Jesus will say, like in Matthew, go out into all the world. Proclaim the gospel. Baptize. You know. even, in, even when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll notice something else. During his own earthly ministry, Jesus did send disciples out to preach, didn't he? And to heal people, etc. So even in his own time, Jesus was empowering people to participate in his mission. That's the big difference. We just don't follow Christ. We just don't read about him and tell people, you know, here's our new philosophy of life. We are participating in a mission. That participation is so important. The number one word Jesus uses to describe himself is what? The one who is sent well, we too are sent. We're participating in that reality. It's so much so that we have, uh, the whole Eucharist is about exactly that. We have, we, we've missed a lot. The church has it, but we tend not to get it. If you pick up the big book that's in the sanctuary that we read the prayers from, if you look at the side of the book, it will say, since this is the Latin rite, Roman, it says Roman Missal, M-I-S-S-A-L. Why is it called a Missal? It means... Sending out. In fact, in Latin, uh, I don't know why we have distorted this in English, but if we were to say Mass in Latin, the expression that the priest would say after the final blessing is Ite Misa S. Ite misa est. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the Latin language, ite is plural imperative. A whole group of people go. And <clears throat> misa est is the passive tense. There is a word that is understood that's not mentioned, but it is implied because it's to an assembly. The word is ecclesia. We translate that as church, but ecclesia means the called out. Right? Called out and together. It's actually, which means you, go. You are sent. It's a sad mistranslation to say, go, the Mass is ended. Or the Mass is ended, go in peace. It's not really go in peace, it's get out of here and get going. <laughs> the Catholic Church is the only church you can go to where they can throw you out. <laughs> On purpose, you know. Get out of here. <laughs> you see that in Acts of the Apostles. They're all looking up at Jesus ascending and an angel says, stop looking up and get moving. 
<clears throat> well, that's the whole point. We don't look up to Jesus. We walk with Him. It's a big difference. So that's why you go through this chapter of the Gospel of John. As I said, it sounds so convoluted. Because Jesus is trying to say that this is a different experience. Participating in the reality of Jesus Christ. So that we too are on mission. I would further point out. I've done this at a homily before. I just said, ite, misa, est. Saying that goes back a long way. Early centuries. How do we know that? Well, one way is if you go to the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem during a period back in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, uh, the famous Franciscan archaeologist Father Carbo, uh, they closed the church down for about two weeks or so. There had to be some reconstruction. This was a great chance for the archaeologists to get to work, just like they recently did to rebuild the edicule inside the basilica. What was discovered is that in, it's in the section that's under the control of the Armenians. Remember, the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre is built above a series of caves. It had been originally the rock quarry for the stones one of, the, one of the rock quarries to get the stones for Herod's construction of the Temple Mount platform. So, before the church was dedicated, on what, 334 AD, um, obviously a group of pilgrims had come in. And so before the church was dedicated, they may have come for the dedication, we don't know. But there's a graffito. You can look it up on the internet yourself. And what they drew on the wall, carved on the on a wall that's in, under, going under the substructure of the basilica, they show what looks like a fishing boat. All right, and a large fishing boat, the type you would see on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it shows the mast is down with the sail fl uh, folded. There's an oar, and then there's the, another oar in the back. That's, the, the, that's how we had a rudder. <clears throat> and obviously these are pilgrims from Rome because they wrote something under it in Latin. Ite misa est. Go, you are sent out. They wrote... Domine Evimus. Domine. Direct declaration. Lord. Evimus. We went out. Ite. Imperative case. Evimus. Plural. President. Lord. We went out. How do you explain your life in front of Jesus Christ? Think about it. What would you say? You've got five minutes and Jesus is going to show up. What are you going to tell him to explain your life? There's only one thing, really. Lord, I went out. The best thing you can say. I went out. I participated in the mission. Very important. Yes, you've got a question. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, the point is, you, you'll notice we always get confused. And uh, what you just brought out is something everybody thinks. Everybody thinks exactly the way you do. Well, it's well inaccurate. Uh, <laughs> and I've had a good. 
Here's what we keep forgetting. We think evangelization, you look at, at the outside world and you think evangelization is advertising. We can't help it. Here's the, here is how, and everybody thinks of just like that. Well, I'm not really going to sit there at the corner of Main and Second Street and start, you know, waving a Bible. That's not it. Remember these famous words of St. Francis of Assisi. Preach constantly. And sometimes use words. <laughs> oh, yes, that is awesome. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's living itself. You know, everybody else is doing something and you seem to be a little bit different. That's it. You don't have to use words. All you have to do is say nothing and stop by a homeless shelter and feed somebody. Uh, we have that wonderful project here, Room at the Inn. And a lot of times people don't know what it means to do something that turns a heart to faith. Here's an example. There's a man in Memphis. Uh, he gave a retreat uh, for the brothers, and I attended that retreat at Christian Brothers University about three years ago or so. Uh, he, he had been on the, in, in, the, in the religion department of the university. He took another job. He's now academic dean of Memphis Theological Seminary. But he started a place that some of you may have helped at. It, it, it's just called Manor House. All they offer is, in the morning, coffee and some bread and pastries. But the big thing they offer from 8 until noon, men on one day, women on the other, is a chance for a shower for homeless people. Just a shower. And maybe socks. Socks are always big. Yeah. Well... <clears throat> He's got volunteers from all over the city. You know, from all kinds of churches. And he tells the story that um, one day, after helping for about a week or so, uh, some of the volunteers came up to him and said, uh, I'm not going to advertise the man's name, okay? Uh, here, especially YouTube, I don't want to. It. <clears throat> get out, but let's pick a name. Let's say Peter. And they come to him and say, uh, Peter, this is really beautiful what's going on here. Uh, when are we going to have a chance to give our witness to them? And he said, You don't get it. This is their chance to give their witness to you. Mm -hmm, that's right. And so, this is new. Uh, that's why I said the vocabulary seems to be so stretched here. Because Jesus is trying to explain something that, that's never been experienced before. There, even St. Paul had to coin words in Greek that were not ever in the Greek language in order to explain something. It's a different experience. We don't have, didn't have the vocabulary. Now you'll notice uh, if you go down to the last verses. Look at verse 32. Behold the hour is coming and has arrived. When each of you will be scattered to his own home. And you will leave me alone or abandoned. But I am not alone because the father is with me. Jesus talked about his passion as part of his participation in God's plan for our redemption. Jesus says, you're, you're going to be scattered. Now remember, we're talking from the time Jesus said this, it's only about two hours from those words before the arrest takes place. 
I've told you this so that you might have peace in me. In the world you will have trouble, but take courage, I have conquered the world. Conquer the world doesn't mean like an emperor. Conquer the world means overcoming attitudes. I've conquered the misperceptions of humanity about what they think is a success. How many people ever use the word successful mission, right? This program was a success. You know? Look, or even as Christians, we still have attitudes that Jesus says he's conquered. So I've conquered the world. I'm not alone. You may abandon me, but here's Jesus talking about the Father is in him. This is God's plan for, for your life. Now, chapter 17 begins <clears throat> what is called the priestly prayer of Jesus. Now think about it. This is a whole chapter that's a prayer. And if you'd like to do something for Good Friday, read John chapter 17. Or maybe with a group of you together, reading a sentence and stopping for, you know, a minute, just to meditate on it, just to feel it. Not just to meditate thinking about it, but rather meditation to feel it. Very often we get into meditation, we have the uh, attitude we're supposed to think about something. We keep forgetting that meditation is taking the time to let it feel, you feel it. When Jesus had said this, he raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son that your Son may glorify you. Just as you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to all you gave him. Now this is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent Jesus Christ. Now that's a strange passage, isn't it? Where do you hear again earlier, this is eternal life, that you may, that you should know the only true God and the one whom you sent. That's early in the gospel, isn't it? Especially, I am the bread of life, Right. So you've got a connection here to the Eucharist, but there's something about this that's different. Jesus just said a prayer, correct? Now you hear, now this is eternal life that you should know, that they should know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. This is the only time in, in all four Gospels where Jesus himself uses the term Jesus Christ. So what's going on here <clears throat> is that that sentence is an interpolation of the evangelist. That's a response of him. That said, it's not Jesus speaking, but that's... Oh, here's an example. Remember when we did John chapter 2? And we heard, destroy this temple in three days or raise it up. And then the evangelist says, it was after the resurrection that we remembered he had said this. Remember back again in John chapter 12? After Jesus says something, the evangelist points out, Jesus said this because he had seen his uh, Isaiah songs, and we remembered this after the resurrection. See, the resurrection becomes <coughs> the lens through which people are able to see the life of Christ and what he said and remember it. 
Those words, I'm going to send you another advocate that will teach you everything. The Holy Spirit. You know, that we remembered something. Now it makes sense. Even the, even the prophets. That's what Isaiah was talking about all along and we missed it. That's what the prophet Danny was talking about. And so now, we have here, this is the beloved disciples' comment. You know, this is eternal life. Then Jesus goes back to praying, I glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with you. And with the glory that I had with you before the world began. The one, Jesus Christ, is the one through whom all things are made. And now how many people think that the crucifixion, it's easy for us to talk about the resurrection as the glorification, correct? But Jesus is also talking about the passion is also the glorification. How? Because it is through the cross of Christ that we are redeemed. Through the cross, Jesus, God accomplishes the plan of the restoration of communion and friendship with him. Now, Jesus will go on. <clears throat> um, look at verse 17. Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I consecrate myself for them, so that they also may be consecrated in truth. Identification here, the Christian believer is sent. We do more than recite the creed, what we believe. We are sent. We're participating in a mission. Becoming consecrated in truth. Here, truth does not mean mathematical evidence or the logic of empirical methodology. The word I mentioned, remember the word for truth in Hebrew is emet. It's not only, here are the facts that happened. But truth is also mean to be true, to be faithful, to be counted on, dependable. You can count that this is real because the individual is dependable. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. I consecrate myself for them. The consecration of Jesus Christ is his cross, his passion. That they also may be consecrated in truth. The reality of the cross and the resurrection. Now we come to this. Remember, this is Jesus Christ praying. You can't get more intimate with another human being than when you watch them pray. You are never most truly yourself than when you've prayed. And so this is like eavesdropping into the secrecy of Jesus Christ. We realize that the deepest intimacy is to hear somebody else in their prayer. And I don't want to be uh, flippant or or, you know, be kind of acting smart right now. 
but I mean this in sincerity. It is easier, it is easier for people to be naked together than it is to pray together. I'll give you an example. Uh, for those of you in the YouTube audience who may not know me too well, I really do have, I really am in the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, I was in a movie once. Well, anyway, uh, and so, so I'm kind of big on motion pictures. Well, there's a famous movie starring James Cagney entitled, it's, on the, it's a biography of the famous actor Lon Chaney. You know, the character actor, the horror movies, you know, Phantom of the Opera, Hunchback of Notre Dame. It was a whole movie about Lon Chaney and star Jimmy Cagney. And, uh, and Lon Chaney's parents were deaf. The children were okay. And their, his parents, they had a school for the deaf and the hearing impaired. And when Lon Chaney got married, before they got married, he never told his wife that his parents were deaf. He kept it as a big secret. And the first time she met the family, it was just a shock to her. The next scene, one of the next scenes, is that they have their first child and they're living now in Hollywood. And they live far out in those days from, you know, Los Angeles. And their child is sick. And they've called for a doctor. There's a thunderstorm going on and the child is still asleep. The fear is, is the child deaf? Lon Chaney shows this scene. It's unforgettable. He goes to the back porch or the side porch of the house and he goes to pray. And the way he prays is he's making signs. And his wife comes up at the door and just watches him. Here's a man praying the only way he knows. And his wife says, Are you going to cut me out of that too? He doesn't invite his wife to pray with him. That's why I said, this passage, this is why this passage is so powerful. You're at the heart of Jesus Christ in secret. And then he says the following in verse 20. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe me, who will believe in me through their word, so that they all may be one as you are in me and I in you. This is Jesus Christ praying for us. For all who will believe in me. Here we are. Almost 20 centuries later. But it's today. This is Jesus Christ. Praying for all of us. That concludes our study today. As I said, because of a Holy Week, etc., we will not have our class next Monday, and the office is closed the Monday after Easter. The church will be closed down, the parish, and so we'll pick up again beginning on April the 29th. Although I will be doing the 15 to 20 minute presentations of Fishers of Men on Wednesdays. Thank you all very much. You're welcome.